Hello and welcome to Erik Pensel Bank. My name is Jonas Thurin. I'm Head of Asset Management and I will briefly go through our, our house view and executive summary is that yes, we're still maximum weight equities. Yes, we still prefer European uh, equities. Um, we're six times as much of weight in Sweden compared to, to world, uh, the world, uh, world Index. We're about 35% underweight in, in the US. So that's executive summary. Um, but for those who are interested, we'll now go through this a bit more in detail. We are fortunate enough to have a green traffic light, i.e. Um, a bit more than 90% of our mandates over $50 are, are still above the benchmarks, both long term and short term, which of course are, are grateful. And it's a direct consequence of our optimism for the equity market this year, which we're happy to, to have caught. So in terms of our low risk and medium risk portfolios, they have actually already returned uh, a yearly uh, return. Now, given the, 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 the slack we still have since 2022, we're going to keep on working in order to, to close that gap. Uh, but obviously, it's more encouraging to, to have that great start of the year. So global equities for us have done about 10.3%. We keep, as you know, an active view on the dollar, um, sorry, on, on currencies. So we have shifted away from, from dollar exposure and put a lot more into to sterling, Nokia, Swedish Krona and, and, and Euro. Um, but, but so far, so far, so good this year. Um, the geographic exposure, as I mentioned, we are severely underweight US, even though the bar looks looks impressive high, and severely overweight Europe. Um, and also, we have shifted down since last time I spoke, some six percent almost from from dollars in in in, in favor of, of euro and, and CEC so forth, and even sterling. The, the sterling, don't confuse this, that we don't actually have a sterling equity strategy. We have bought US, uh, some US equities hedged in, in sterling, so we get the sterling stock exposure. So that's more of a currency overlay uh, thinking than, than, than having a, a part on, on in the UK, uh, which we don't. And it doesn't look like we're going to buy UK equities for some time, unfortunately. Um, in terms of uh, how we perform versus our index, yes, we, we're doing quite well. Um, and peers are just, and this is a bit unfair because we're comparing ourselves as we should a discretionary mandate. We use its funds, so it is what it is uh, in, in that sense. But you have the same strategic and tactical association uh, maneuver capabilities within those funds as we do in our discretionary. So obviously we're fortunate to have that our performance, but then again, that we should have a very sort of a humble view of looking at that, given the fact that we're not using its um, 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 discretionary mandate whilst they are, and that puts some severe limitations on what you can do, actually. Some possibilities as well and opportunities, but also limitations. Now, uh, we think, and as you can see, as soon as we write Outlook 2023, this is what we wrote uh, in, in early Q4 last year. Uncertainties will fall, and we happily conclude that media is a bit less overly negative uh, compared to the equity market than we were when we started the year. And I think that is quite positive. And I think a core culprit behind the, this turnaround in sentiment, if it holds, is the fact that IMF, European Commission, are revising up the growth forecast and revising down the CPI forecasts. We think that's spot on. We, 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 share, the, you know, we share on that and we, that's the position we've had. Uh, and, and quite interestingly, they're actually ahead a lot of uh, Swedish banks, which is sort of, that shouldn't happen. Uh, but it seems to be happening this time around, which is, of course, a great opportunity for us to outperform, which you could see on the, on the previous page. Uh, we still believe that we are in a macro context of moving away from high inflation and low growth to low growth and normal inflation. That by itself, since 1970s, means that S&P, rather than falling on average 10%, should grow on average by 15%. So we, I would say we're Maybe a third way of what we could be doing this year if nothing extraordinary negative happens, which we of course monitor the whole time. And then what drives the markets? And you can pretty much divide this into three blocks. And I'll show the history of 2022 on top of where we saw political risk, geopolitical risk, and inflation as the main drivers of, of, of the equity market. Now, it's, if you combine financial conditions and macro, we can actually derive and explain 92% of the equity move, not only in, in direction, but also magnitude. That means that we know, quote unquote, that we, all, we need to focus on financial conditions and macro, and notably, not profits. Um, and, and when we do this, we can pretty much divide the whole reasoning into three categories. In, inflation, um, the, the Fed pretty much driving the financial conditions, 
and uh, growth. If we can sort of pinpoint where those three factors are going, we should be having a high statistical um, uh, capability or, or, or accuracy in determining where the equity market is, is going. So to begin with the inflation outlook, I would call that this inflation will roar in 2023 was, was a bit iffy to write in that, in that sense. But obviously now that Powell is using the word disinflation, we, we think this has been pretty much validated and we can sort of relax this. There is still an abundance of models indicating lower CPI going forward. Now we're a bit more skeptical on, on this month reading given where, where the gas prices have been, but we think that 6.1, 6.2 seems to be absolutely fair. Uh, and arithmetically, we you all know that due to the base effects, the inflation trajectory is of course pointing downward. So we still believe in our forecast of sub 3% by summer, some sometime in, during the summertime. Now we don't think the CPI is sticky. So we don't have the view that wage growth is sticky because wage growth is falling right on cue with the headline inflation. So there's a very positive and strong statistical relationship between these two series. But it's not that one is leading the other or there's an underlying relationship between one and the other, which I think is quite not. Basically, we don't believe in the Phillips curve. Um, and you can see some other categories moving lower. Now this, and then, sorry, I can, I can skip forward to the Phillips curve to show that the relationship between these two variables, unemployment rate, for example, and, and inflation is virtually non-existing. If you look at the entire time frame since 1990, which I think is quite fair given the Greenspan start off in 87, and you actually have a positive correlation now between unemployment rate and wages. So you don't, have, you don't even have negative correlation, which sort of is what has to happen first. And then we can discuss if there's a, it's a statistical relationship between these two variables. But that is very short term, you can say, but don't forget the supply bottlenecks is falling off a cliff. And they have been, we'll be, I think we'll be showing this graph for over a year now. Um, and, we, and we still believe in it. Uh, you know, we saw you know, how the inflation pressure was building up to March 2022, which was when we put on the foot and said, this is the peak of priced inflation. It has still been the peak of priced inflation pressure in the US. And then headline inflation peaked in June, and then the equity market started to react going into October by the Fed pivot. So everything sort of works uh, almost like every three months we're ready to take. You know, first off, obviously, as always, fix the income market, and then uh, you have to make the money market uh, work, and then you have the equity market. So we're following the same trading pattern that we, we quite often follow. And what's also quite positive here is that we don't see uh, a rebound in inflation anywhere. Uh, sorry, um, you also have a negative price pressure from China. So they are exporting uh, deflation as we're speaking, if you look at the spread between CPI and PPI, uh, which is quite interesting, obviously, with the, with the effect that, that could, could have on the US. And if, if you actually look into the import price data going from China to the US, you can actually see this deflationary pressure starts to build up. So obviously, um, there is a, a war here, both in terms of tariffs, but also in terms of can you slash your prices to handle the tariffs and still get market share. Um, this is the sort of traditional game that we've seen between China and the US ever since Trump's, um, uh, when they increased tariffs. Uh, and that will probably continue for some time. And let's see what, what Europe can do in this context. Uh, pretty interesting to see that the one year inflation outlook, if you look at what the consumers are telling us, they believe that inflation will be below 2%. It's quite aggressive, I would say, but you can't deny the correlation between these two time series in the past. The, the magnitude you could, you, could, you could certainly go against. But for us, it's really interesting just to see the lead time and, and also the magnitude. So, so there's nothing here that sort of says that there's anything going through on, on wages and so forth. And just as a quick sort of side note on the last now from payrolls data, that was 517, some almost 300 uh, more, more jobs created than we thought. Um, it was quite clear there was multiple jobs in service sector, often by a temporary status. That's a great number from payroll numbers, but it doesn't drive wages, which you can see in the wage data. So it's, it's um, I think the devil's in the detail here, really, if, you, if you're going through, through the outlook. So this all means that the market still believes that yes, Fed will hike and then they will cut rates. The, the same that they had believed since a year ago, but the level is different. And the level is really what, 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 what it makes last year an awful year in terms of both equities and fixed income returns. 
as you, you remember, global equities and global fixed income did equally bad. So minus 17% on both ends. Um, now, the, it's quite interesting to see that we still stick to that we're going to see 25 base points cut in December 2023. And this is nothing new, really. Uh, if you look at on a two-year time horizon, the market is certainly telling us that the Fed will be lower, but even more than 25 basis points. We're looking at one and a half percentage points cuts uh, from the Fed. And Bank of England and ECB will follow the cuts. Notably, not Riks Bank yet, um, but this is, the pricing of Riks Bank is a bit iffy sometimes, some, some days. Um, but it, this, this kind of lowering trajectory means that Yes, the curves will re steepen. We already know this. Um, and then we can just trade according to, depending on what kind of positions you can take and, and act upon. But it's nothing new here, really. Um, what is a bit new is that after the pivot in October, this is the first time you can see some of the green bars developing up in May. That means the Fed might go to 525, 550. And this is what sort of scared the equity market last week. We saw some, some, some tumbling around in the equity market. We didn't end up losing too much last week. Um, but we also need to remember this is a 5% probability in the money market. So I know there's a lot of talking, a lot of articles being written about the hawkishness and what this could mean for the Fed. Like, like, like. But in terms of if you, if you study the money market, you can see, yes, there's a probability there. Yes, it's growing. Uh, but it's also awfully slow. And if you look at the fundamental factors behind the equity market, they are considerably bigger. So we decide just to keep calm in this period and we keep calm also over the CPI number tomorrow and, and take it from there basically and not overreact on, on, on what is in, in the, mar the rate market price as a very small probability, which is sort of has to be a guiding star here in, 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 in rather than um, articles or, or hawkish uh, comments from, from Fed that we know they need to talk hawkish in order not to, 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 to be forced to hike as much. Uh, the rate outlook for us is still to be long. We have this position since 4.2% on the 10-year and we keep on hanging on to it. And this is not slower GDP growth or recession risk that I know some are writing about. This is a consequence of lower inflation. Uh, simple as that. And why we know that is because growth is picking up. And I come back to that. A quick comment though on financial conditions. We said that they will plateau and fall. This has been ridiculously correct, this, uh, this forecast, which we're quite happy uh, to, to, to hold in. But don't forget, we had tight financial conditions for quite some time. Um, and that, of course, has real economic impact so that we still see a soft landing. The growth outlook, if you look at our own high frequency data built on 217 data variables, you can see the trough and rebound, which obviously leading the equity market. And this is, of course, very encouraging, but it's just not our model that sort of making this kind of trough and turnaround. If you look at the uh, recession risk uh, on a more arithmetic uh, methodology, you could, you could argue, uh, you can see it used to increase before recessions. And right now, you're actually falling off a bit. So we see about 20% 20, 20 recession risk in the US. So we still believe that you're going to have a negative uh, industrial production numbers year on year. You're going to have uh, this kind of soft landing. And you're going to have increased um, probability of, of, of recession in the US, but not actual uh, recession. So that's quite quite uh, interesting that you know obviously this will be met by rate cuts uh, from 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 the Fed. There's nothing new here really. I mean we already knew this. We're going back to to 2022 uh, Q4. What is a bit newer, if you could argue, is this kind of trough and rebound that we start to see in global indicators. And this is really quite, quite exciting because that means that the, the cyclical momentum that the consensus thought that we we're going to have, i.e. we're going to have 100% probability of a German recession, we're going to have a European recession, has to be revised away. And we can see it from IMF and we can see it from European Commission. Notably, some banks are still lagging in this, which we think is great because they're going to force them to, to increase the equity allocation, which might be neutral, even underweight. Uh, and as we already invested, that's great uh, for, for, our, for our customers. But this kind of a massive shift in the growth outlook, all this kind of trough, still not arguing they're going to have tremendous growth or anything, but just that with the fall has stopped and actually turning around is enough to create what we've seen in the equity market. Now, notably, if you look at how the data is revised from IMF and the actual GDP growth, you can see that both for advanced world and emerging, we are revising up almost the entire world. There are some notably countries that are not following. UK, as I mentioned before, we, we might like the sterling versus the, 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 the stocky. 
but we don't like the UK equity market. Notably Italy and China are getting the biggest upside revisions. We have positions in those two countries. Um, and, and US is not lagging too far behind. And notably interesting also Germany that's sort of picking up. So, and I think it's quite interesting that we're in this world where IMF and, and European Commission is almost acting ahead of banks and the consensus from banks. And that is certainly not the historical context that these things used to happen. It used to be the banks were more opportunistic and a bit more, more uh, fast or more, a bit more quick to, to revise their forecasts. And I think it's quite interesting and quite telling uh, that there were, some banks are still behind the curve on this one, which I think is great because that means that they might be forced to buy more equities. Now, uh, this is just the now cost models from, from OECD showing the pickup again in, in Germany and US. And remember, just um, back in November, we were supposed, you know, 100% guaranteed, um, no, guaranteed a, a, a German recession. Now, we didn't think that because we didn't see it in, in, in the data. But it's quite interesting that, that we were so rewarded in, in European equities and they were already made a yearly return on the allocation portfolios. Um, so so it's, it's, it's quite interesting. It show, I think that shows more uh, of how wrongly positioned people have been in, in this kind of growth outlook that we're facing. So where are we going now? I think in terms of Germany, picking up. Uh, German equity market is picking up and we can front run that by some six months. And it's quite interesting to see we still see this lofty momentum in German equity markets going forward. And to forecast the, um, the composite leading indicators from OECD is not very tricky. I think it's pretty interesting though, is that we do know that some big banks are using that as an allocation or an engine for the allocation in equity markets. It will be quite interesting now in February to see how many will be forced to shift their equity portfolios. Yes, short-term data in Germany are picking up. We don't have to study that in too much detail. Financial stress or systematic stress is falling in Europe, which is great for the equity market, of course. Um, now, notably Sweden, we still have this distinction that we have a very soft or even a recession in terms of uh, the personal consumption with a high leverage, etc., etc. Remember, we're hiking rates to kill off a supply-led CPI bubble. Um, and we started hiking rates while we were already in a recession from, from the retail sales perspective. Um, but it's also quite important that earnings revisions are uh, moving on the upside in Sweden, which is quite positive. Uh, so in, in Sweden, we have this kind of two-tier view um, that we have a soft consumer, but that's not to be confused with what's happening on the equity market, where we're quite optimistic. And if you front run the equity market with our model, you can, you can see the tremendous upside. Might not go, go all the way, but I think it's, it's, uh, it's a lot more interesting to own Swedish equities since late or, or mid Q4 than we start to really buy into it than, than, than it was before. Or, or even buy into it now, to, to be perfectly honest. So we, we maintain those positions and we'll see, see what happens. Uh, we can skip the currency, but in terms of equity outlook, very briefly, I think it's very important to remember that the equity sentiment that burst up in, in, in October, uh, given the Fed pivot that occurred then for, uh, for, for us as asset allocators and, and traders, um, I guess the actual, uh, if you call the pivot, when they actually changed the, the trajectories, that's sort of more of a, a boring period because it's obviously going to be front run by, by the markets by some six, six months, this, the game that we're playing right now. They, it's quite important though the equity sentiment has maintained a very lofty level for a considerable amount of time, just waiting for the equity market to catch up. So I think that's, that's obviously very, very constructive, very positive. If you look at our equity risk model and you build it on rate spreads, CSS and volatility in fixed income in emerging markets, you can see also a tremendous nice and upside for, for the equity market. If you look at free and greed, you see upside moves there as well. And it's the first that we had for, for some time. So there's nothing here that really warrants to be um, as negative or be concerned, actually. Uh, we should just you know, have, have sort of a, a cool head and, and keep on with our occasions. If you look at counterparty risk, dollar liquidity and vol curves, you can also see in our data models that you, know, you still have a tremendous relief rally due to the financial conditions than the, what's happening in the money market in the US and compared to what was, had been priced into the, the equity market. Now, notably, flows are coming back. This is something we argued what, what was to happen in 2023. Uh, we've already seen some, uh, you know, the cash positions going down from 25 to 20 percent in institutional investors in the US. Obviously, that's a great help to the equity market, especially when they've been focusing on Europe as we have. Uh, so obviously, um, that's a, that's a delivery great upside in their portfolios. 
And to be perfectly honest, either you were there or you were not there. So either you caught this or you didn't catch it. And if you didn't catch it, you, you're gonna, you, you have this FOMO equation that starts to pop up in your head. Should you buy now? Uh, should you wait for the equity to come down? Uh, for us to be nervous on our equity allocation, given the, the, the journey we've had in our portfolios, it would almost take a 20% downside move in equity price before us to really uh, trigger something major. We probably won't wait for 20% because we're probably going to be a bit more greedy than that. But it just gives you the, the context of, of the, 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 the vastness of, of the numbers that we, we, we're working with now. That uh, yes, you can, you can hope for the equity market to come down in order to buy. But it has to come down quite a lot for, for it to be, to be worth the, to sort of not to be in the game to begin with. So flows are definitely being forced back to the equity market. Options are supporting this. The whole Hubel uh, liquidity ratio is showing the same thing. People are more stressed about missing the upsides than they are eager or, or, or nervous in order to, to get out on the downside. So people are still playing the upside game, which is great. Allocations will come back, nothing new here. And obviously, one of our most scary outlooks for 2023 was the fact that earnings revisions was to trough and then rebound. It has troughed, it has started to rebound. So uh, this is something I'm quite thankful for because this is a bit difficult to forecast. But the fact that earnings revisions are, I mean, they're still negative. I mean, the earnings are, are, are not very good from a from national accounting point of view, but they are better than the market anticipated. And earnings revisions have turned the sign. So the second derivative is moving upwards, which is great for the equity market in terms of momentum, the direction and so forth. So that's key to our outlook for 2023. Um, it happened a bit quicker than we thought perhaps, um, but we are happy to, to, to having the, the guts to front run this as well. Now the price target estimations are still troughing and that, as you can see, it's a really great data series to, to catch um, the sort of the, the troughs and that we certainly had. So this piece of outlook has been working uh, like a charm so far and, and we're gonna keep on with the positions as long as, as it does. Uh, why aren't we too concerned? Well, because economic surprises are developing on the top side, i.e. only revisions are following macro revisions, um, and, and macro revisions are great because we can measure them every single day. So we are quite certain that earnings revisions, and we were not too nervous about this, we have to crack lower to, to quite a degree before we, we're going to see another move down in earnings revisions. And why am I going on about earnings revisions is that if you want to front run the equity market, you have to look at earnings revisions. It's not enough to look at 12 month forward EPSs because they're probably some six months behind. Or if you look at actual earnings, they're great if you want to do an economic model, um, but they don't lead the equity market. So this is quite, quite interesting to us. Uh, and I'm going to finish off with one of our, well, before, I'll just a quick look on retail sales for this week. Don't forget, we're still in a, a global credit uh, positive uh, momentum, i.e. the world is, is pushing out liquidity, obviously front run by China and US. But this is creating a completely different world in 2023 than we had in 2022 when we saw tight credit liquid uh, conditions and a negative Centix environment. And Centix is quite important because that combines both the, um, the, uh, the, the sentiment, but also if you actually put some money behind your words. I, not just, yeah, I'm bullish, but it's actually, okay, if you're bullish, how much do you buy equities for? If you're bearish, how much do you short? How much do you sell it for? So if you combine that, which I think is a great work by, by the Centix, you also have this kind of positive momentum. So if you're negative or you're underweight or, or whatever, you pretty much miss the world, uh, to, be, to be brutally fair here or to be brutally honest, uh, which is quite, quite, uh, quite a, an original uh, thing that it doesn't happen that very often. Uh, quite, quite interesting beginning of 2023 here. Uh, so the retail sales are moving on the upside, as you can see on the high frequency data, it's not too difficult to forecast retail sales anymore. You can look at credit cards, and you have two models here, depending on if you look at retail sales from a Bloomberg perspective or a Macrobond perspective, you can see a rebound on both. So that's something good, uh, i.e. The, you know, the, the, the rate hikes are affordable in that sense. But also you can see some downside industrial production, which is also good because you can get this soft landing kind of thing working. Uh, so it's, it's, the, the house view is, is maintained and unchanged since, since the last couple of, couple of months, basically. And you can now get it in a, in a one pager. This is pretty much in, in Swedish, but if you want it in English, just let, let us know. We can translate it for you so you can get everything in, in one page uh, quite, quite conveniently. Uh, and with those words, I thank you so much for your time and patience. And I will be back in a couple of weeks and we'll see what happens to our maximum overweight equities on, in, until then. Thank you so much.